another big question uh, as we're moving along here. Uh, what is the nature of space time? Uh, because we looked at, at space um, and we opened with the question, what is space and time? Well, uh, from uh, general relativity, we, we have uh, the um, uh, revolutionary idea that, that it links these two together, that space and time are indelibly linked together. They're one and the same thing. So you get this uh, space time. Uh, quantum field theory um, had produced the remarkable conclusion that space is full of energy. Uh, so the, the geometry of general relativity is resulting in forces like gravity. Uh, so already suggesting a, a structural characteristic of space. And now from quantum field theory, uh, space is uh, understood to have a kind of ephemeral substance, uh, this ever fluctuating uh, um, field of these, these ghost particles, uh, um, fluctuations of the, the quantum electrodynamic vacuum. Uh, so this uh, understandably is a uh, disconcerting conclusion for the dis disconnected worldview perspective. Uh, because not only did quantum field theory say that all the seemingly separate and independent objects we call particles and forces and, and all the different ways we have to, to identify things as separate or, or independent, uh, they, they were in fact uh, just quantized excitations of an extended of extended and continuous fields. Uh, these fields and their associated uh, quantized excitations uh, were uh, present e uh, even in what should be empty space. Uh, how could anything be regarded as truly separate as isolated uh, if this is indeed the case? And, and that uh, goes back to the uh, statement by Leonard Susskind on uh, ultimately this idea of separation of, of the even possibility of isolation is obviously erroneous. Therefore, the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics is obviously not uh, fully correct. It's not the last word. Um, so we have to be able to describe systems uh, as these uh, like collective wave functions uh, uh, evolving unitarily and becoming more and more entangled. And as they become more and more entangled uh, across these causal patterns of space time, uh, higher and higher levels of, of order and organizational synergy uh, emerge. Uh, so uh, from the multiply connected uh, substantive, energetic, and uh, micro-scale order of space, we begin to see that there is no truly isolated system, uh, that all points are interconnected in a universal interacting network, what is called the connected universe. Uh, so here we will we'll begin to examine uh, the space-time continuum and its modern uh, extension uh, what we have developed, uh, the, the entanglement network of space memory. And that term uh, space memory, I know I introduced it kind of out of the blue at the start, but uh, that that's, uh, already should be giving you an indication of uh, how we're going to answer this question about uh, what is time. Uh, so time is uh, inextricably linked with space, almost one and the same thing. Space has substance and informational structure. It can record information. Hence, it has a memory. Uh, and, and the way that th this can happen, it can be observed uh, empirically, observationally, um, in, in things like, like uh, um, macroscopic quantum analog systems, which use a, a fluid dynamic system to show how a medium can have uh, memory and even uh, guiding functions of, 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 uh, for particles. Uh, but uh, it, it brings us uh, to the, the question of, okay, so, so we need to look at time. What, what is time? Um, well, 
probably uh, conventionally in our, our kind of common sense experience would be that that middle representation there, a fixed timeline, and you got this growing block universe that is, uh, there is a past and there's a present and it's uh, incrementally forming uh, the future. Uh, but it's really present. You've got this long past uh, and the world lines, the, the, the space-time causal networks uh, of this arena of the universe from a space-time perspective are, are fixed. Uh, well, uh, general relativity showed us that th this is wrong, uh, demonstrably wrong, um, because depending on your frame of reference, uh, i.e. Your, your, um, whether you're in an in inertial or non-inertial uh, system, an accelerating or non-accelerating system, uh, what you perceive as the past will be different from someone in a different frame of reference. Uh, so the, the, the future, to one observer can be your past uh, simultaneously. Uh, and we know that this occurs, um, that this, this kind of uh, relativity of simultaneity uh, that emerges from general relativity. So the future uh, must already be there, um, uh, as well as the past, present simultaneously all the time. Um, so uh, this, I think, begins to, to uh, become a, a pretty good uh, uh, brain twister uh, because uh, so if time, uh, all potential time already exists, um, how do we explain that this uh, experience of a temporal progression uh, and certainly a linear uh, progression of, of change? Uh, but it, the, the, the answer really is that uh, fundamentally, the, the thing we call time does not exist. Uh, there's this an eternal, ever-present now moment uh, that has uh, a hyperdimensional quality where the future of some observers and the past of other observers and everything in between all exist uh, simultaneously in parallel. Um, but, um, what we will see, uh, as we, uh, begin to investigate the, the space memory, uh, entanglement nexus, uh, we will see how, um, the thing that we do call time is bi-directional and, uh, world lines can be changed. So that this middle depiction, that this fixed timeline, uh, is inaccurate, incorrect. Um, in fact, it, it is in part due to the timeless nature of the universe. I, I often call this a transtemporal uh, interconnectivity, transtemporal uh, interaction. Uh, that world lines uh, uh, can be uh, uh, changed. Uh, and the, the universe uh, has a specific uh, non-random but natural uh, ordering and organizational mechanism. Uh, and it's closely related to the bi-directional flow of time. Uh, and actually, importantly, uh, you, you know, so we know we, we need to move past the Copenhagen interpreta interpretation of quantum mechanics. Well, uh, one of the ways forward that appears most successful at this time is to uh, uh, admit or allow uh, the uh, bi-directional flow of information in time, uh, retrocausality. Uh, this resolves some of the, the hard problems of uh, quantum mechanics, although uh, it's a little bit 
difficult for many of us to uh, consider signals going from the future to the past and from the past to the future and the, uh, the past can change based on what sig signals are being sent. Uh, but if you look at some experiments that have been done, like uh, Wheeler's, John Archibald, Archibald Wheeler's uh, delayed choice experiment, uh, you can actually see where um, uh, this is observed. Uh, you know, so uh, they, they look at, uh, they, they've measured uh, entangled photons from a star 600 light years away, uh, and they see that uh, what appears to happen is, depending on the choice of the observer uh, on how to measure uh, which spin state the, these particles are in, um, their choice will seem to stretch back and change uh, the properties of the, these particles when they were first emitted uh, 600 light years away, 600 years ago. Uh, so so I'll, I'll get into that in, in more detail. 